all of those who were participating in that great rendition of Hark the Herald Angels. I bet you can remember when you were a kid and you were singing that, if you're my age anyway, you were singing that in choir class. That was required when I was in middle school. You had to take music class. Now they've canceled them all, but fortunately we have people that are a little younger, like the ones who were just on screen, who were able to get their music thing on without music class necessarily. Happy Holidays, Merry Quisp Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Everything. We need to be able to be encouraged by the holiday season, and we hope you're encouraged. First, let me get a couple things out of the way before we get going. Here's a card. I got it last year when I was in the beanie mood. I'm back to beanies. This card had Oregon on it. As a Stanford and Michigan fan, I wasn't too excited about that. But it says on it, Hi Russ, thought you could use some new headwear for Sunday mornings. Go Ducks! I almost had an allergic reaction when I said that. But fortunately, a couple of my buddies sent it to me, Jason and Wendy Andrews, and I promised myself when I got it last year, it'd be the first hat that I'd put out, even though my bud Duran got me some sweet looking Stanford gear. I actually held my word. Oregon, whole episode, happy holidays, but no go ducks. Maybe we can put some Stanford clips in there of them knocking Oregon around just so I don't feel bad. And then Mariah Kroos gave me an update. So I'm gonna put to rest this cup holder and warmer and add my holiday one. All right, we're getting in the spirit. Hope you're getting in the spirit. Thank you, Mariah, who's made it her goal to be a little elf and produce elf overload. She's created her own North Pole, and she's sending gifts and little trinkets to various people all around. She thinks other teenagers and kids should do it. I don't know if you will, but it sure makes me happy. Sure makes all of us happy here. Thank you for Mariah from the digital team. All right, just had to get that done and make sure everybody's fired up and excited about our service today. The service, learning to believe again. Learning to believe again. And I don't know if you're like me, but I need to believe again. And our, our thematic companion for our message, jingle, jangle. That's right, jingle, jangle a musical extravaganza of holiday inspiration packed in the one movie that was written and prepared and developed over 20 years. Gotta watch it. When you watch it, make sure you wear a seatbelt or you'll be jumping out of your seat, jumping out of your bed and jumping off your couch to dance every second. You'll notice if you watch the movie at the very beginning, 
Mrs. Cosby from The Cosby Show. She shows up in Jingle Jangle for all those people who love Mrs. Cosby. And if you notice, when she opens the book to read and tell the story to the kids, I won't tell you who the kids are. I will give away a few things today. It says on the front of the book, the invention of Geronicus Jangle. You know why it says that? Because the whole story of the Jingle Jangle is about how the jangle can take the jingle out of your life and that you have to sometimes reinvent yourself after some difficult times to put the jingle back into your life. And our goal today is to get the jingle back into our life. And our first point, our first thing to talk about is the invention of Geronica's jangle. In other words, this is a story of a man played by Forrest Whitaker from South, South uh, uh, from Compton. I think he's from Compton. And he's a great actor. I didn't know he could sing so well. But it's played by Forrest Whitaker. He's Jeronicus Django. And it's a really great performance. And for those of us who are a little older in life and have gone through some of the pain and suffering and difficulty of life, this movie is going to hit the spot. No, I don't get any money by pumping up the movie and talking about it. The invention of Jeronicus Django. What do we learn about Jeronicus? He's the greatest inventor of all. And I know a lot of you are complaining, not again. You went through the whole movie, Elf. Now we're going to go through this whole movie. No, we're not going to go through the whole movie. We're just going to go through half the movie. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you also will be. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas, he'll be important here for a couple of minutes. He's one of the apostles, one of the disciples. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The compelling nature of Jeronicus Jangle is that at the very beginning we find out he's an inventor, the greatest inventor of all. He has an assistant, Gustafson, and Gustafson, which I have trouble saying that name, Gustafson and Edison and Journey are three key characters. He invents something that's incredible, Jeronicus does. I'm not going to tell you everything he invents, you got to go watch the movie. It's incredible. And then his assistant, who's bummed out that he isn't inventing anything, and a bitter and mad that Jeronicus isn't helping him be the best inventor he can be, steals the invention. But at the beginning, Jeronicus is very excited. Everybody's dancing. Everybody's singing because he's just found out he's got the solution and the answer to make his great invention. He has faith. He has incredible faith, and it is a spiritual movie, and it is a faith movie. What I want to talk to you about for a moment is that in this world of trouble, where so many of us are going through so much, where there's so much hurt, so much pain, so much difficulty, a lot of disappointment, we have to make sure that we understand the way to keep life from knocking us down and keeping us down is to believe in God. That's what we learned to believe in God. Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. When trouble comes, believe in God. When you're troubled by something, believe in God. Let's go to John 20 and verse 24. Same guys there, Thomas. And that's who he's talking about in verse 24. One of the 12 wasn't present when Jesus appeared to them. So Jesus died on a cross so that all men could have their sins forgiven. He was raised from the dead so that eventually we too could be raised to a new life. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, he showed up to see all of his guys he'd been with, all of his apostles. But guess who wasn't there? Thomas. Thomas was gone. Where was Thomas? At an Oregon Ducks game, maybe? I don't know. At in and out I don't know. Playing Xbox? I don't know. But he wasn't there when Jesus showed up. One of the 12 wasn't present when Jesus appeared to them. It was Thomas, whose nickname was the twin. So the disciples informed him, we have seen the Lord with our own eyes. 
still unconvinced, Tybush replied, there's no way I'm going to believe this unless I personally see the wounds of the nails in his hands, touch them with my finger, and put my hand into the wound of his side where he was pierced. One of the things we learn about Jeronica's Jangle is to invent and to do special things in your life. You've got to handle it when life's been knocking you down. And one of the things you find about Thomas in the Bible is that Thomas is a committed disciple. He's always willing to go for it, but he, like all people, struggles with doubt. He struggles with wondering if it's going to happen, if it's going to come true, if it's going to work out. He wonders if the pain, the suffering, and the loss is going to be permanent, if God maybe is letting it happen to him, or if God's going to make it happen to him. A lot of us can lose our joy and can lose our inspiration and can even lose our faith because of the fact that bad things happen, and when bad things happen, we doubt. When trouble comes, we doubt. And that's why Jesus said one of the key things we have to do is keep believing in God. It seems so simple, but it's so hard to keep believing in God, especially when life knocks you down. Now, at the beginning of the movie, Jeronica's life isn't really knocked down. He's actually talking about all he had to go through to get to the point where he was being successful. But he said, when you're going to be successful, life's going to knock you down. And Thomas right here, he gets knocked down. What happens? He's been following Jesus for three years, and then Jesus dies. Have you ever had a sense that you really know God is with you? Great things are happening. All your friends are Christians. Your family's Christians. Everybody's celebrating. And then someone says, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. That happened to me early in my Christian life. A leader I really respected. A guy I really admired. I tried to be like. One day he just decided, I'm not going to believe in God anymore. I'm not going to go to church anymore. And I was only about two months old as a Christian. Just two months. And I was confused. I I didn't know what it meant. It was what Thomas went through. He had believed all this time, and then all of a sudden Jesus was killed. And he didn't, I don't think he thought Jesus could go down. And so all of a sudden his world was turned upside down. So when he showed up and all these guys said, we've seen Jesus, he was like, I'm, you know, he said, I'm not going to hope again. Have you been there recently? I'm not going to hope again. I don't want to hope again because if you hope, you just get disappointed. And so he said, I'm not believing unless I see it myself. In John 20, 26, then eight days later, Thomas and all the others were in the house together. And even though all the doors were locked, Jesus suddenly stood before them. How about that? They had some ADT going on, man. They had some of them. They had some of that lockdown so that security on the house. They had cameras and junk. Jesus hacked the cameras, hacked the locks, walked right in, and boom, there he was. And even though all the doors were locked, Jesus suddenly stood before them. Peace to you, he said. Then looking into Thomas, looking into Thomas's eyes, kind of nerve wracking, huh? He looked right in his eyes, looked into his soul. Then looking into Thomas's eyes, he said, put your finger here in the wounds of my hands. Here, put your hand into my wounded side and see for yourself. Thomas, don't give in to your doubts any longer. Just believe. Then the words spilled out of his heart, you are my Lord and you are my God. The invention of Geronicus Jangle is a story of a man who had to see his way through doubt multiple times. And later on, it was devastating what happened to him and crushing. If we're going to be able to stay Christians, not become Christians, if we're going to be able to stay Christians, we're going to have to learn how to handle doubt. We're going to have to learn how to handle the things that go wrong. You know, at the beginning of the movie, when all this is going on, Jeronica sings, young Jeronica's jangle sings, and one of the lyrics from the chorus is, even though life's been knocking me down, I had to figure it out, see my way through the doubt. And when it seems I'm lost, turn and found my way. What I got in my hands could be the spark, turns it all around. Could this be happening now? All my life, I've waited for this day. 2020 has been hard. And for a lot of us, we can be extremely disappointed because all of our life, maybe we waited for something to happen. And yet we have to be able to see our way through doubt because oftentimes, through doubt, getting through doubt, the best things in our life begin to happen. And Jesus 
in closing out this interaction with Thomas, who found his faith again. He found his faith again. He learned to believe again. In Jesus in John 20, 29, Jesus responded, Thomas, now that you've seen me, you believe. But there are those who have never seen me with their eyes, but have believed in me with their hearts, and they will be blessed even more. The great story of Jeronica's Jangle is when Journey shows up, a little kid. And after Jeronicus loses his faith, she teaches him to believe again. And she teaches him and he teaches her that the key in life is to see what other people can't see. That's what Jesus is talking about here. We're in a world surrounded with people who don't believe, who don't see what faith allows us to see. We cannot allow that to steal away our faith. And right now, maybe you're having trouble in your job. Maybe you're having trouble in a relationship. Maybe you're having difficulty believing. Maybe you've been out, I've been out, and walking along and you feel disillusioned or you feel like, is God really there? Don't give in to the doubt. Keep believing and understand the dreams you see, the hopes you have, even though no one else sees them, God knows you see them. God has put them on your heart. And that is what it means to invent. And so now, in order to be able to get you sort of set and inspired, we have a Christmas story for you about the power of faith and the power of prayer. Let's take a look. Christmas story. Twas two weeks before Christmas, when all through the bay, not a person was traveling, we all had to stay. Our parties were canceled or turned into Zooms in hopes that we may not feel all alone in our rooms. But God is a God who sets the lonely in families and gives us others who help us keep our sanity. As we approach the holidays in all their glory, let us encourage you with another Christmas story. Once upon a time in a land not so far away, Arissa Lagunzad began praying for her mother, Fuse to build a close relationship with God. But she felt there were so many obstacles. Her mother was 90 years old, believed deeply in her tradition, and spoke only Japanese. But Arissa kept praying year after year without giving up. A few years ago, Fusei moved in with Arissa and her husband and her family and started coming to church with them. Though Fusei only spoke Japanese, Arissa's friend Micah began translating Bible studies and lessons for her so that she could come to midweek services and study the Bible. The women in Arissa's house church loved up on her mom, prayed for her, shared their lives with her, and treated her like their own mom. After much prayer and love, Fusei was baptized this year in the middle of the pandemic on August 19th. She now studies the Bible with women her age in Japan over Zoom and has begun reaching out to other moms in need of the encouragement of spiritual family. Fusei's story is amazing and it inspires us to pray. And it reminds us of another story for this great holiday. Once there was a faithful single sister named Susan Berg. When she moved into a new apartment complex, she decided to build family with her neighbors and met Marilyn Van Gestel, a single mother living in the same complex. In the true spirit of Christmas, Marilyn came to a local holiday service and loved the feeling of family she saw. She decided to study the Bible shortly after. Marilyn had disabilities and was in a wheelchair, and so at first could only have her Bible studies in her apartment or at church on Sundays. But God gave her a spiritual family that changed her life. On Father's Day, Brian Kling spent the entire day building a ramp outside his house so Marilyn could have her Bible study, fellowship time, and midweeks in their home. Being included in such an incredible family helped Marilyn become a Christian shortly thereafter. And that, dear listener, is where our story ends. And as we learn that family can come from our friends. I hope you enjoyed these stories I read as you bake another loaf of your sourdough bread. Remember in darkness, you can be a light. Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Oh, I mean morning. <laughs> all right, Christmas story. That's our new segment. Did you like that? You're gonna get more of that. There are more of those coming. Happy holidays, happy Kwanzaa. How about that? Nice, right? 
learning to believe again. We just saw it in the Christmas story. Guess what? Jeronicus Jangle, he invents this incredible toy. You have to watch the movie to see. But then his assistant, Gustafson, steals it from him. And it's a long story, but he steals it from him. And he steals it from him. And here's the lyric from a song they sing. I can see your name in lights, Gustafson and Don Juan by your side, a rare opportunity if you learn to borrow indefinitely. You know, one of the things he talks about, Gustafson says, is borrowing indefinitely, that it's not really stealing when you borrow indefinitely. It's easy. It's not stealing when you borrow indefinitely. That's what it talks about. But have you ever had somebody betray you? Have you ever had somebody lie to you? Have you ever had somebody steal something from you? I have. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because you lose what they stole from you and you lose the relationship because the relationship's not what it was before. Pretty amazing. Pretty difficult. Jeronicus Jangle, not only does he lose his invention and not only does he lose his friend, and there's a positive thing. This ends up, this ends up pretty happy story. So don't get worried. But not only does he lose his invention and he loses his friend, but eventually he loses his wife. She dies. It's almost like the story of Job. Sorry to give away that highlight. And then he gets estranged from his wife, I mean, from his daughter. It gets bad. I was pretty bummed out. I was like, you got to watch it. You say, you stole it all away. Not even close. Not even close. And you knew if you checked out our invitation, we were going to talk about this. So you had to be ready, do your homework. And what about stolen life, stolen dreams? Who steals everything? In John chapter 10, the Bible talks about the fact that the one who steals from us is Satan, the devil, the forces of darkness. And in Luke 22, in verse 31, it says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift you men like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail, and you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. What does the Bible say? What does Jesus explain? That Satan likes to sift us, that he likes to take us through the grinder. He likes to break us down. The pandemic has been one nine to 10 month long breakdown. It's been a pandemic that has been meant to crush us, both from a human point of view, but from a spiritual point of view. I think sometimes it's easy for me to forget we're in a spiritual world. Sometimes it's easy for me to forget there are forces of darkness. Maybe you come from a background where you're not very religious or you're not really into that kind of stuff or you kind of think it's a joke that there's a Satan. But I think if you are philosophical and maybe even you're not biblical, you know that there's darkness and there's light. We all believe that evil comes from somewhere. One of the great philosophical questions is where does evil come from? The Bible answers the question by saying there are forces at work in the world that are dark. Whether you believe those forces are at work in the battle between God and the forces of evil, or whether you believe those forces are at work inside the heart and minds of men, there are forces of darkness. And the drift of the forces of darkness is to break us down, to, to, to sift us in such a way that we end up having our marriages, our children, our friends, our jobs, Everything can be broken down and taken away. That's the story of Jeronica's Jangle, the pain of loss. And one of the great lines in the movie comes from someone named Mrs. Johnston who's trying to talk to him and says, Jeronica, I know about losing things. Stolen lives, stolen dreams. Maybe you're sitting there today and you're deeply discouraged because you've experienced this. I looked at life and I said, what are the things that if I've seen stolen from friends, I've seen stolen from people, well, number one, failure steals opportunity. We feel like our life is a complete lost opportunity. We live in regret. Number two, shame. We feel great guilt. We lose our innocence. We used to not feel guilty. Now we feel guilty. And then we feel shame and embarrassed. We stop wanting to be vulnerable. We stop wanting to be transparent. We stop talking to our spouse. We stop talking to our kids. We stop having close friends and we start having superficial friends because we've lost our innocence. What's another stolen thing? And remember, who steals these things from us? This, the devil, Satan, forces of darkness. We can't get focused on people. We can't allow ourselves to get angry at the relationships we have because one of the great deceptions 
that the forces of darkness have is they want us to think that a human being did it to us. They want us to get out there and shout and be angry and want vengeance. That's what we want. They, the forces of darkness want us to hate each other, to tear each other apart, because if we do that, then no longer do they have to do any of the work because we are now stealing things from each other. Shame or lost innocence, disillusionment, lost trust. I prayed a lot about that in my life. I went out for a prayer and I was like, man, I'm trying to fight disillusionment because the people I thought over the decades of my life were going to believe certain things have stopped believing those things. And it's disillusioning and you lose trust, not just in people, in God. I started asking God, what are you doing? Why is this happening? I think we have to deal with our doubts like Thomas did. Brokenness, lost relationships. We used to be close to people. We used to, we used to go out with them and hang out with them and talk to them. And now we don't at all because the relationship is broken and it's lost. Rejection, lost hope. The rejection of ideas. The rejection of ourselves personally. Maybe we liked somebody. We thought we were going to have a dating relationship and we got rejected. Rejection can cause us to lose hope where we no longer look at life from an idealistic point of view saying, as the, as the little boy did in the, in the movie about angels where he said, hey, this can happen. Hey, it could happen. We no longer have that idea that, hey, it could happen. We've lost hope and we walk around all the time saying, hey, it's not going to happen. Don't talk to me about good things. It's, it's not going to happen. And then death, the actual death. I know I had my sister die of brain cancer. My dad died of lung cancer. And when death happens, it's lost love. I go back and can remember being a little kid and we're all driving in the car going on a vacation. And then you remember back and you realize that that, that, that incredible moment in life, you never anticipated that where you would be years down the road was it would be lost. I know right now that some of us are dealing with that kind of loss. We've had family members die. We maybe couldn't go to the funeral. All of these stolen things, all of them, are the work of the forces of darkness. They want us completely disillusioned, completely broken, completely ashamed, feeling like failures, isolating because of rejection, feeling like we can never love again because of the loss of someone we love so much. All of this is in the movie, all of this is in our lives, and all of this is why we have to learn to believe again. And so let's get a little hope from a story of the week, Rose Margaret McCauley, Contra Costa South. Take a look at this and beating stolen things and stolen dreams. My name is Michelle Collette and I'm excited to share about a friend of mine in the Contra Costa South part of our church, Rose Margaret Makaule. When Rose Margaret turned away from God, her relationships and her resolve grew weaker. But in coming back to God, she has become stronger, more loving, and more determined to make an impact on others than ever before. After becoming a Christian as a teen in Nigeria and attending college in London, Rose Margaret started to drift away from her convictions to follow the Bible. She felt more pressure to please people than feeling free to follow God and decided to pursue her own plans and ambitions. Three months at grad school, I lost um, two very close family members and uh, that was really painful and uh, made me start being angry with God, asking God, why, why, why? And um, that stopped me from being vulnerable to God. She found herself detached from friends in an abusive relationship and unable to keep up with the challenges of a demanding career and family needs. I realized it still wasn't working um, because all I was doing was then just following rules, doing what I had to do. And that only leads to burnout. Rose Margaret decided to pursue spiritual friendships again with people who shared the scriptures, the pain and struggles of their own lives, and helped her to see the truth about her own heart as well. So I realized that if I wanted to do what I do for the long haul and um, stay true and live a fulfilled and happy life, I had to change. And so I was lucky that I had friends in my life 
um, that connected with me and never let me go. She started to grow in her faith as she remembered all the ways God had cared for her and all the promises that the Bible had about her future. Started creating my spiritual village um, with women that I could really be vulnerable with and um, they loved me for who I was. And just looking at the scriptures to see that God loves me for who I am and that he's got my back. And looking back now, everything, every pain was kind of for a purpose, that he had a perfect design. Even the changes I thought were painful at the end of the day um, was all for good. God gave Rose Margaret the strength to resolve her relationships, get married to a Christian man, and use her career to make a difference for others. As a professor of electrical engineering at Ohlone College, she was featured in a news story last year about building a better Bay Area with her smart manufacturing program. She has joined her friends in community service efforts and has worked as an advisor with the UN to produce a video helping girls and women of domestic abuse. Rose Margaret is now studying the Bible with a friend of hers and sharing her renewed faith in the scriptures along with her renewed desire to change the world around her. Oh, man, that, that right there, that's a story of the decade. Let's keep rolling. I don't need to say any more. See, Rose Margaret McCauley taught us learning to believe again. You can do it. You can do it. I know, I know. I've been down. I've been feeling it. I've been feeling it. You've been feeling it. I've been feeling it but we can believe again. I want you to think about who you're mad at. I want you to think about what opportunity you feel like you can never get again. Come on. I want you to think now, before you get ready to to, to, to cue up Jeronicus Jangle, I want you to just think about that. I want you to just think about something that hurts so much you can't let it go. And I want you to let it go. I want you to let it go. You know what I think? When we let it go, we grow. That's right, when we let it go, we grow. And on this segment, the me who used to believe. I want you to think back to when you believed. Maybe you have to go back to your childhood when you believed anything was possible. Maybe it's your high school years, maybe it's your college years, maybe it's the beginning of your marriage. You know, sometimes it's good to think back. It's, it's good to stir up those memories. And sometimes for those of us who are older, it's hard to think back because we remember what we wanted to be. We remember what we wanted to do. And we're afraid to remember what we wanted to do. We're afraid to recapture that idealism. We're afraid to recapture that hope because we think if we hope again, if we believe again, we're going to get hurt again. We're going to get disappointed again. It's hard, I know. Maybe you have a disability. My family's a family with disability. Maybe you have an emotional health challenge. I have a lot of friends and a lot of family members around me that, in, uh, friends and family that have emotional health challenges. Brothers and sisters in and outside of the church. And it's a great deal of challenge involved in that. And it can make us, when we have disability, emotional health challenge, maybe you've experienced intense racism. Like maybe you're sitting there and going, no one understands. People think it's a thing of the past and you're thinking in your life from your examples, are you kidding me? This is a thing of the present. And you feel like talking to people is like talking to a stone. I want you to go back to that person who fought to get where you are today and recapture the me who used to believe, to believe that people will change their racism, to believe that people will change their prejudice against emotional health, to believe that people will change their prejudice against disability. That's the world we want to live in, and those are the people we want to be. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, yet we who have the spiritual treasure are like common clay pots in order to show that the supreme power belongs to God, not to us. We are often troubled but not crushed, sometimes in doubt but never in despair. There are many enemies, but we are never without a friend. And though badly hurt at times, we are not destroyed. The me who used to believe has got to get off the map. You ever been knocked down? I've been knocked down. You got to get off the mat and don't let whatever happened to you take your faith away. And that's what happens to Geronicus. 
he loses everything. And then his granddaughter shows up. And I'm telling you, the granddaughter's name is Journey. He has a little mentor, mentor, mentoree named Edison. And he discourages Edison and discourages Journey until eventually they get to him. And they start to get to him. And they start to get him thinking. He doesn't want to believe anymore. He doesn't want to invent anymore. He turns his invention shop into a pawn shop. Instead of inventing and creating new things, he's going and getting old things and selling them. Have you found yourself there? Instead of going for the new, you're always going for the old. Instead of looking forward, you're looking backward. And all of a sudden, he's sitting there, and Forrest Whitaker plays Jeronica's Jangle, and then he starts to sing. It's one of the best songs in the movie. Over and over again, I think on my life and what might have been. So much that I could have achieved, yet I stand here alone in defeat. My inventions were born while my girls cheered me on. I can still hear their laughter today. In the shop we would play, all our dreams we'd create. Can't forget the sweet smiles on their faces. I love to remember, but it's hard to remember because remembering won't bring, those, bring back those days, those days. And then he sings in a resounding chorus, tell me why, why? Tell me what all this was for. My life should have meant so much more. Oh, when did I leave the me who used to believe? I wish I could somehow believe. You know, all of us, we're in that fight. That fight to every day keep the me who used to believe from being past belief and instead being present belief, fighting to keep our faith, to keep that me who used to believe from ever being a used to and always being a now believer. That's what we want to be. That's what that song's about. And when you watch the movie and you see Forrest Whitaker struggling, struggling, because the pain is telling him, don't believe, and he's fighting to believe. He's got the kids there, a new generation of believers saying, even when he says, I'm not an inventor, I'm not the greatest inventor, the kids keep saying, you're the greatest inventor of all. No, I'm not. You're the greatest inventor of all. We need people around us who will say, you're the greatest inventor of all. And you know what? I've got, I've got, a, I've got a lineup for you. A story of the week that's going to help you say, wow, if I invent and reinvent my faith, I can help others have faith. A story of the week that's going to show you that when we do good, it gives people hope. And then it's going to be something from last week that I just had to give you again. When we get the kind of faith that's alive and working, like in the, in the story you're going to see, alive and working in the doing good update you're going to see, then that's when we start making things look a lot like, well, it starts to begin to look like Christmas. Take a look at these three great, wonderful things in a row. A trifecta. Hi, my name is Mr. Moala, and I want to bring you an incredible story about how friendship and faith has the power to transform lives. Grace is a registered nurse working and living with her roommate Filipina in Oakland, California. In 2015, Grace's mother Leticia came from the Philippines and moved in with Grace and Filipina. Over time, Leticia was impacted by the love of the disciples and asked Filipina if she could study the Bible with her. After a few months of studying the Bible, Leticia decided to become a disciple and got baptized. From that time, I had the vision that I, we must have the church in, the, in my place in the Philippines. Yeah, because I don't want to grow old here. <laughs> Grace uh, formed a group, and then with Filipina, we prayed, to, uh, we prayed together. And then I was thinking, wow, it's a long, long prayer. With her small group of seven mature women in Alameda, they decided to take 40 days to pray impossible prayers, specifically for God to start a church in Tarlac. Soon after that, Leticia asked her other daughter, who is a disciple in the International Church of Christ in the Philippines, if she would be willing to ask some of the disciples to start a Bible talk in her hometown. It's 
started by um, single disciples. My sister invited um, brothers from Manila would come like every Sunday, three hours, One way. Yeah. 45 miles from Tarlac mm -hmm. and have a full Sunday service in Tarlac. People were willing to come and help out, but financially with that every week traveling, that was a challenge for them. As the numbers of disciples and friends visiting grew, Leticia and the mature sisters from the Bay Area brainstormed on how to support the needs of the group in Tarlac. My mom, she was working at a hotel at that time. She thought, oh, let's sell recycled bottles. <laughs> So we started collecting bottles. The mature women started helping financially. Yeah, if I think about that, I don't know what may, what gave me the courage to solicit money, really. I want my relatives around our play, around, around our house. Yeah. My friends want to win them. They raised money, got donations from other disciples in the Bay Area, and sent money to purchase chairs, sound systems, children's ministry supplies, including hundreds of books and digital resources to strengthen the fellowship. Just last week, at their second year anniversary celebration, the church in Tarlac, Philippines, presented a certificate of appreciation for the Bay Area Christian Church for their love and sacrifice. I always tell the people that there, the disciples there, also those who are attending the church, that this church in Tarlac is a fruit of my faith that was planted by the disciples in BACC. The faith of Leticia and her friends inspires us that when we pray and believe, God can do the impossible. Good morning. We're excited to be here this morning with you and wanted to update you on some of the great doing good efforts we've been involved in. You know, even though our annual toy drive was completely virtual this year due to the pandemic, we still were able to make a big impact. Teaming up with the Boys and Girls Club, A Better Way, and Oakland Food Works, we donated over 1,250 toys and gifts to underserved children and families around the Bay Area for the holiday season. I want to share a scripture with you guys. In Acts 10, verse 38, in the easy to read version, it says, Jesus went everywhere doing good for people. We're a church that believes in doing good and every member should find their passion within that. Because of this belief, we have had tremendous impact. Over the past five years, we've donated over 600 backpacks and school supplies to kids in the foster care system. We have provided catastrophic fire and hurricane relief, both locally and abroad in the form of gift cards, emergency supplies, meals, essential items, and monetary donations to meet immediate needs, whether in our own backyard here in Napa or as far as the Philippines. In fact, earlier this year, we were able to provide two to three months of living expenses to the Calipan Philippines Church to help support them through the pandemic. Our doing good efforts not only help take care of families in need, but also support incredible programs like the Hope Technology School, the Bay Area's premier private inclusion and technology school that makes it possible for typical and special needs students to receive a top rated education. And a couple months ago, we talked to you about eLife, an expansion of our eSports programs that have helped bring inclusion to so many kids and families. One of the efforts to promote inclusion as a lifestyle for all ages has been Game Social, a program to help teens and adults have a sensory friendly environment to make friends and play games together. Game Social has especially grown during the pandemic with about 25 to 30 people participating every Saturday. And eSports has continued to provide training and resources online since March. But one exciting highlight happened just a couple weeks ago. The Golden State Warriors contacted eSports to request input on their new guidelines for the Chase Center 2021 reopening in order to make the fan experience more inclusive and comfortable for special needs families. And additionally, they invited some of the lead coaches to go through a training session at their new GSW Academy facility and then sit down to work together in making the Academy more special needs friendly. We are excited about these updates and we're looking forward to growing eLife in the future. So we want you guys to stay tuned in early 2021 as we share how you can be involved in our Doing Good Fund and check out bacc.cc slash doing good to learn more about the grassroots doing good projects that are currently going on that you can be involved in. We'll see you guys later. It's beginning to look 
a lot like Christmas Everywhere you go But Take a look at the five and ten It's glistening once again With candy canes and silver lanes that glow It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Toys in every store But the prettiest sight to see Is the holly that'll be on your own front door A pair of hop along boots and a pistol that shoots is the wish of Barney and Ben Dolls that will talk and will go for a walk is the hope of Janice and Jen And mom and dad can only wait for school to start again It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Everywhere you go There's a tree in the Grand Hotel One in the park as well The sturdy kind that doesn't mind the snow It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Soon the bells will start And the thing that'll make them ring Is the carol that you sing right within your An episode that shoots is a wish of Barney and Ben. Dolls that'll talk and we'll go for a walk is the hope of Janice and Jen. And, and Mom, Mom and Dad, Dad can hardly wait, wait for school to start again. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Soon the bells will start. And the thing that will make believe is a carol that you sing right with me. All right, let's get that faith back. You feeling good? You feel, I'm feeling pretty inspired by all of that. I hope you're feeling inspired. And you know what inspires me the most? Christians doing good and making a difference. Because you know what one of our dreams is? Is that using our digital tools, we'll be able to empower people anywhere in the world to start a Bible talk, to start a house church or a church. And guess what we're gonna be doing in 2021? We're gonna be releasing a set of tools for anybody in the world who wants to pull up and start their house church in a state or a city where you say, I wanna be able to create the kind of loving and encouraging and powerful experience I'm seeing on the live stream. Guess what? You don't have to move to the Bay Area. You don't have to do it. You can stay right where you are in, in Iowa or, or Saskatchewan, Canada, or in Nigeria, like the great story we saw. You, you can be wherever you are. That's our goal. And we're going to help you wherever you are to do what they did in Tarlock, to start your own thing. And eventually we're going to have in 2021 resources where you won't have to get on a plane. You'll be able to get on a Zoom and you'll be able to learn how. We're going to change church building around the world. That's our goal in 2021. How about that? That sound good? That's what the Bay Area ought to be doing, right? That's what we ought to be doing. It's called the square root of impossible. That's right. The square root of impossible. Let's get on down with it. What's it what do we need to know to get out of here? We need to know this. Faith is an inside job. That's what learning to believe again is about. In Ephesians 3.14, So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on earth. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Remember this. Faith is an inside job. It starts with prayer. A lot of times we don't want to pray because we don't believe. That's the exact wrong reaction. When you don't believe, it's the time to pray. When you don't believe, it's the time to hang out with friends and get encouragement from them. And like I told you, the young granddaughter, Journey, comes in town, and she has so much faith that she energizes Jeronicus's faith in the movie. You got to see it. And boy, can that girl sing. That's a whole nother story. Next, faith is not only an inside job, Faith is a love story. Learning to believe again means not only you've got to do the inside work on your own heart, my own heart, to get that faith pumping again through prayer and through friends that have faith, but you also have to understand that faith is a love story, Ephesians 3.17. Then, by constantly using your faith, so you can't leave faith on the shelf, you've got to be using it. 
then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love, how enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Do you know what faith does when we believe in God? It puts us in touch with a God who loves us endlessly, who loves us unconditionally, who loves us through thick and thin. And when you hit the bottom like Geronicus did, or whether you're at the top, you can always count on that love. Faith defies gravity. Learning to believe again. Never doubt, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Faith defies gravity. When we let faith be an inside job, pray in getting friends who help us. When we understand that faith is a love story, it's about experiencing God's love. It's not about learning the rules of the church. It's not about getting our behavior in line. It's about experiencing the love that even when we sin, even when we fail, even when everything falls apart in our life, God is there and he is not finished yet. And that's what we learn about Jeronicus Django. Jeronicus Jangle finds out about the square root of the impossible. See, for him, the square root of the impossible is a theory. But there's a scene in the movie where the two kids, Journey and Edison, have to escape from capture and from fire. And Journey yells to him, the only way we will get out of this is the square root of the impossible. And Jeronicus goes, no, the square root of the impossible is just a theory. And both kids say, essentially, we believe in you. And at that moment, Veronicus does the thing he does in the movies when he's ready to vet. He puts his hands together and he begins to rub them almost like Miyagi and Karate Kid. That's going back. And the magic comes because he begins to see how to do the equations again. It's magical. And you know why he began to believe again? because Journey and Edison believed in him. And when he began to believe again, he was able to defy gravity. What are you thinking you can't do? What are you thinking is not possible to overcome? Well, that's exactly what God is in your life for. If you just wanna be ordinary, yeah, you don't need God. But if you wanna be extraordinary, you need God. And see, Journey, when she shows up, the little girl, the granddaughter, he doesn't even want her around. But by the time she gets done, She's turned him around and she turns him around with a wonderful song called Square Root of Impossible. Where's the world that you created and the stories that you painted with words that made me feel 10 feet tall? Where's the magic in the moonlight, the surprise hidden in plain sight? No, I don't see much to inspire much at all. And I'm ready now to fly away and gravity won't get a thing to say. It's my choice if I get to touch the sky. Is it possible that the square root of impossible is me? Is me. She's telling Geronicus, is it possible that everything you hope would come to pass, I've come here to help you believe again to make it come to pass. And then she sings so beautifully in the chorus, it's so possible. Watch me rise high above my obstacles. Watch me become who I'm supposed to be. Oh, the possibilities, because the square root of impossible is possible in me. Sunday morning jetpack, take it away. What's up, guys? This is Sunday Morning Jetpack. And today we're going to be talking about believing in the importance of small beginnings and how God loves it when we just take a leap of faith. Yeah, sometimes all you need is a small beginning to make all the difference. 
I was super shy in middle school and spent an entire track season not talking to anyone. My dad told me we weren't leaving until I said something to someone. At the very end of the day, right before our last race, I told the girl next to me I liked her glasses. I was so proud of myself. It was such a small start, but it was a start. You know, you may not have the same social struggles that I had, but we all have those mountains that we feel are impossible to overcome. When it comes to having faith that God chose us for something great, it can be easy to get overwhelmed by the work we think it would take to get there and give up before even trying. But the point isn't to already be where we think we're supposed to be. It's to start, no matter how small that beginning may be. Yeah, Alex, I got a scripture for you. In Zechariah 4, verse 10 in the NLT, it says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. You know, this scripture says that we shouldn't underestimate small beginnings. When we believe that God put a specific vision on our hearts, we will take action no matter how small we're starting. You know, for me, when I don't believe that God chose me, I don't take action. I let my fears that I'm too young, too inexperienced or messed up get in the way of living that purpose out. I want to wait until I'm confident enough to take action. But this week, I realized that believing isn't that fuzzy feeling. And I may not feel good enough, but God says he chose me. And believing that is all I need to take action. Believing this helped me make small decisions to call people I've been afraid to call, speak up in ways I was afraid to speak up, and more. And it feels really small. But like the scripture says, God loves to see us just start. Because he can work with that to make it something greater than I ever could on my own. All right, Parker, you got to listen to this song called The Square Root of Possible from the movie Jingle Jangle. It says, I might not be there yet, but I'll get there. Bet on it. Because I'm already three feet off the ground. Don't tell me it's too far to go. I know that I'm unstoppable because the square root of impossible is me. You know, this song is amazing because we might not be where we think we're supposed to be yet. But when we believe that we are meant for a greater purpose, we can keep pushing forward despite our fear. So maybe you feel like you'll never be the kind of person to be chosen, but you can't compare who you think you're supposed to be to who you are now. God is the one who makes you great. So you don't have to wait until you're good or courageous enough or until someone tells you you're great to start living out that purpose. It doesn't matter how afraid you are or how small you start. God loves it when you take that leap of faith. And that is your Sunday morning jetpack. For a more in-depth Bible study, be sure to check out the article Small Beginnings on deepspirituality.com. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you for joining us today. In a few minutes, we're going to have communion. You'll get a little other talks from a few people and you'll be uh, all done. But before that comes up, I just want to take a moment because it is the holidays. Next week, we'll be having our holiday concert. So please share and invite people to come next week. It's going to be a gala time. I probably won't be talking as much. It won't be a traditional sermon. It'll be more of just an incredible concert together and a time to celebrate. And you know why? because all of us are going through a hard time. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to say, this is not easy. This is not easy, but we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. Vaccines are coming. We're sticking together. We're holding onto our faith. Let's remember to get our faith back, to learn to believe again. And in the middle of it all, I want you to take a break for a moment and just relax, really. I want you to relax right now. And I want you to know this, when you read the Bible, that one of the things that God resoundingly tries to tell his people from Genesis to Revelation, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You might say in the words of a Christmas song, if I were to gather together a bunch of people like Frank Sinatra and, 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 Jim, and Sammy Davis Jr. and all them and put them in tuxes and I'd probably say, come on guys, sing a song. Here's a song. Sing all as well. That's a great song. Sing that. Help everybody believe that it's going to be okay. But why do I need all those guys when we've got our own people? Take a look at this wonderful rendition of the holiday song, All Is Well.
Let me 